American TESOL Presents Free Friday Webinar. I'm Shelly Sanchez Terrell, and this is Ross Godepug. And today we're going to talk about gamification um, in your classroom, how you can gamify your curriculum. Now, gamification is different than game-based learning. So we have done a webinar in the past on game-based learning. Uh, just to let you know, we have hundreds of these presentations. They're free. So anybody can come, they can attend. You can get a certificate, um, that's free as well. You can find all the recordings and you can get all of the hundreds of bookmarks that we have um, as well for free. And you can find all of that when you go to this bit.ly address um, that I'll put in the chat box, which is bit.lyelt links. I should have put that in the presentation, I didn't. <laughs> So there you go. Thanks, Tim American Teasel. <laughs> okay. So gamification. Gamification is when you use different types of ways, uh, motivation you, you use from games. You try to design your curriculum to where you implement things that you would see when playing video games. This is one of my favorite pictures that I have found on Flickr. It's Creative Commons. And I just love this, the, their faces. And the reason I love their faces is because you can see how motivated they are. There's been a lot of research and studies. Particularly, it started with World of Warcraft. A, a lot of people around the world, they started learning English because they started um, learning through playing World of Warcraft because it's a very social game. Sometimes you wear headsets. And together you do things like from the past, there's a lot of history, you build worlds. And so it's, it is valuable learning. You learn quite a bit doing that. And to be able to learn a whole entire language that is different than yours just from playing a game is definitely something we should pay attention to. Sometimes when I share this information, when I share that we have gamification and uh, curriculums that are based on this, then a lot of teachers will respond and say, there's not a lot of learning in that. That's actually, research has proven that that is wrong, that there is actually a lot more learning than a lot of curriculums that just have students pass tests. So I would like you to reconsider it. People like Einstein, people like Maslow, people like Piaget, and people like Fr Freire, all of those learning theorists support, and even Dr. Seuss, that we should definitely try to have different types of play, that play is a high form of learning. So I want to propose to you, and I'm going to pause this real quick, <laughs> that what if when we wanted to learn, whether it be a language, whether it be something like um, a language or math or science, what if we tried to learn and that what we, it was like playing a video game, our favorite video game. So I want you to think about what is your favorite video game. And you'll be very surprised because guess who is the statistic, the growing statistic of the average gamer. You probably would be surprised, but it's actually 50-year-old women. And here's why. Because the games you play on Facebook are also considered video games as well. I mean, things like um, the there's one about Candy Crush that one of my <laughs> one of my friends is always playing and trying to get me to play. <laughs> my best friend. Um, there's other types as well. There, there's uh, beyond Candy Crush. There's um, the garden. There's one on a garden. So all of that is part of gaming. We might not consider that because we're not having joysticks, but world, I know I play Scramble with friends quite a bit, and Scramble with friends is something that uh, for a while I had to stop playing because I kept playing all the time. I got a bit addicted. So a lot of times uh, things that we don't consider a game is actually gaming. <laughs> So what if learning in schools was like playing a video game? Instead of bookwork, homeworks and tasks 
And I'm talking about things like complete the fractions on page 20, or even look at the periodic table on this page, or let's read about this um, physics phenomenon, or let's, let's learn words and English and language through a book. A book is just one of our tools. But if the learning doesn't rise from that, if it's not being applied, then it's not helping our students. What we need to do is go beyond that. That cannot be our crutch. And instead of being given homework, students were given missions, quests, and challenges. I have asked many teachers in a lot of my trainings, and I've been to 26 different countries to train teachers. And I've worked in different settings. I've worked with, I've taught refugees in Greece, um, my own um, teaching there regularly, because I lived there for a little while. And also in Germany, I taught there as well for four years. I had classes there from two years old all the way to 80 years old. Um, and also I've taught in Texas. And all these age groups, I've tried to find motivation. And I find that certain things, as soon as you tell kids certain things, they're going to shut off. And the words, we use words like homework automatically. What kid is like, yay, homework? They're not. So if we can change it, if we can say, here's your mission, here's your quest and challenge, then that already boosts it because then they listen to you and then they're more open to what your homework is. And do we need homework? A lot of people say no. For me, I'm an English language teacher. To think that my students will get the best kind of language instruction and practice and be able to be in those contexts to practice the language in my classroom alone, I, I think that that's not possible. So yes, I believe that my students should practice the language afterwards. I think it's very important. And I think it's important that learning um, goes beyond the classroom. So I would say any kind of learning, if they do math, if they do science, that has to be applied in their life. So for me, I think it's very important that instead we get them to interact with the things around them and put them in context like that. So here's the difference between instead of that original do things from the book, now we see a different type. Here's a different type of task. We are surround your mission. We are surrounded by fractions. They decide how much or little we get in life. So it's important we can figure them out. So the instructions. We need you to find 10 examples of fractions. Take pictures. Um, they can take it with their device. <laughs> um, or if they have just a digital camera, they can use the digital camera. And then they can create four word problems with them. This will teach them more. This will show you more that they understand how to do fractions. And also, this will also help them to see and realize that, yes, fractions are applicable to the world around me. That when I eat a pizza, if I eat half of it, then I should know that. Or I should be able to tell. Um, for example, if my if my friends are letting me play with, you know, I only get to play with a third of the blocks, and they get, you know, a different, you know, <laughs> they have twenty, if they get seventy five percent, and I get twenty five percent of the blocks, then hey, that's unfair. I should really be able to say, well, you you know, let's make this a bit even. So I think that in real life situations, they can really apply that, and they can really begin to think of how this integrates with their life and how it impacts them. Um, and then you can use tools. Just like in a game, you have different tools. You can give them Web 2.0 tools if you want. In this one, they can it can be their camera. Or you can add an app. Or you can add a free Web 2.0 tool. It's up to you. So another part of gamification is this. Instead of grades, and a lot of teachers are changing this, they're not giving grades. They give points and they give badges. Uh, one of the best teachers that I know that is that does great gamification with science, and I think science is one of those subjects that we definitely need to motivate kids 
and students to really want to pursue. And he teaches seventh and eighth grade. So he's been working uh, for a long time with gamification. His name is um, Educator Al. And I follow him. Um, I read the stuff that he does. And I just think it's absolutely amazing. So you can find a lot of things that he talks about in his blog. And I really encourage you to look at his blog. He has a tab called Gamification. And he's very honest with you. He tells you, this is what has worked in my classroom. This isn't what works uh, in my particular classroom. He also talks, um, shares with you spreadsheets and everything that he's done. Now, one of the, uh, the ways that he recommends, and I think is one of the easiest way to, to go ahead and start with gamification, is if you do 3D Game Lab. And I thought that I put 3D Game Lab. Oh, I don't, maybe Peggy can put that in, because I don't know why I didn't link it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but 3D Game Lab, it will allow you to do it for free for 75 teachers. I mean students, so I think that's really great. So let's look more at this, how you can take small steps. And I definitely think you should take small steps. My step so far has been missions. I've also given points. So I, I have done that. I'm not as good with that, but it, it does, I'm not going to tell you that it's not going to take a lot of time. It takes time to adjust. And also you have to check if, you know, it motivates your students. But I found just giving missions was, wasn't that too hard to integrate? So let's talk about motivation. We want our students to do our work. And do we want them to feel motivated to do it? Yes. I don't think that homework should be uh, easy. Definitely learning. In, in, and I'm not just saying homework, but learning. Learning is a journey. When we go on a journey, you're going to have some hills you have to cover. You're going to have to have some trials, and you're going to learn a lot about yourself along the way. But you know what a journey isn't? It isn't tedious and boring to where you don't want to go on this journey. You choose to go on the journey, and that's the difference. I don't think when teachers say, well, we have to make it fun or entertain them. No, that's not what gamification is about. Gamification is about motivation, where we make, where we help students or support them, we motivate them to want to continue this learning journey through life. Jane McConaughey, which is one of the leading voices in gamification, she says, people don't have a propensity for laziness. They have a propensity for hard work. They will work hard for you. Your students will work far, hard for you. It just needs to be work that matters to them. How do we make it matter? Well, let's look at games. Why do people spend 13 hours, 14 hours a day sometimes? Why do we give, think about all the hours you have given to playing certain games, whether it be Monopoly, because that's a game, or whether it be a board game cards, whether it be um, something like, like um, the Candy Crush, or whether it be something like an Atari game. Any of those types of games, why have you spent countless hours? Why have you dedicated hours? This is why. And there's a few reasons why. First of all, it's, it, a lot of times games are social. With Monopoly, you get to um, also be with many, many different types of friends. And you get to go around, and you get to talk with them, and you get to converse with them. And it's really Inter it's really meaningful to be able to do that, to have like a collaborative experience. It also, and a lot of times with video games specifically, it is the world that people want to be in. It has great graphics. It has cool music. It has these adventures in these great worlds where you can go and you can grab different things. Like, um, and, and that's one of the great things about games is you see that learning is all around you. It's not just in one area. A lot of times you have to go in the sky to get points. Or maybe you have to um, go and jump and go through these courses. So you find that your objects and everything are all around. Whereas in a classroom, a lot of times what we do is that we have our students just get answers from one area, like maybe they just get answers from the book, or maybe they just go to the library, 
or and, and it's really important that we get our students to learn that learning is all around them, even in the real world. In, in especially that, we need to connect it to that. It's goal-oriented. We know that when we try a certain level, we can keep playing and trying until we get it when we achieve it. And that's one of the great things is it, 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 failure is part of the journey. You don't get dejected. You don't get demotivated to where you say, I'm not going to try anymore. You actually keep trying till you pass the level. With my students, I think that's very important. I give them time to, if they mess up on a test or a quiz, then they can keep retaking it in some cases. Um, for me, not all the times with the test, but with a lot of times with their quizzes, actually pretty much most of their quizzes now, I've made it to where they can keep doing it. Because for me, um, especially if they're taking an online quiz, if they keep doing it, they keep learning, they keep emerging with the material. So for me, I think that's beneficial. I don't like to fail my students and get them not to try to learn again. I think that's really, that that's not very helpful and that's not supportive. Um, the other thing is they can all be a hero. Is it stressful? Yes. They have uh, a lot of stress, but they call it positive stress. And one of the people that introduced me to this concept, and um, I put that in the bottom, was Paul Maglioni. Paul Maglioni has done so much when it comes to that. So let's look at gamification versus game-based learning. There's a lot of things where you learn with games. Um, this Karen Jarrett is a great person on Twitter. He's a great educator, does really interesting things. And one of the things that he does with his students, which a lot of teachers have done, is they take popular video games, like World of Warcraft was one of the first ones. There's been Guitar Hero. There's been um, Minecraft is the most recent one. And they integrate this in the curriculum. They teach their students through a game. So that's game-based. That's more like game-based learning versus gamification. Gamification we'll see in a little bit. But, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can actually teach a lot through games. And this one with, uh, with Minecraft, you learn how to build cities. You learn uh, building. You learn coding in a way because you have to be able to craft these things. You learn about history. You learn about ancient civilizations. And a lot of different games, you learn about the history. You learn about the Romans, because these tend to be some of the topics of a lot of games, is all of these empires and empire building. Um, and different teachers, what they do with the Minecraft is they also get their students to now they have different types of ways to make them the avatars. Um, it's very motivating. The students really enjoy it. And it's also practicing digital safety. Because the students here, you can see the Minecraft um, avatars covering their faces. And then you don't have to recognize them. To learn more about Minecraft and lessons and everything that it can teach for different subjects, you can go to Minecraft EDU. And then there's one of my favorite blogs called digitalplay.info blog. Digitalplay.info is from Graham Stanley and Kyle Meyer. And what they do is they give you different lessons. And they show you different games. And there's complete lesson plans. And they're all free. So I would say go check it out because that's very cool. They have it for different ages. Um, one of the things that different teachers do, and plus this is an Elton Award winning um, book as well. They have an Elton Award winning book. This is what it kind of looks like. They give you an introduction. They walk you through it. So if you never played the game, it's OK. They even give you the preparation. And then you can go and you can look at it. What a lot of teachers do when they do integrate a game, and if you decide to teach with games, then one of the great things that you can do is you can go and you can um, you can do what's called a walkthrough. A walkthrough is a way that teachers have their students um, pay attention to different parts of the game. So then you can make sure that when they're 
in the game, whatever you want them to learn, like let's say it's building the world, or let's say it's the terrain if you're teaching geography, or let's say you want them to look at the grammar structure if it's the language, and they have the language on the screen, or let's say you want them to listen, or let's say you want them to count. So whatever it is you want them to focus on in that particular world, then one of the things that you would do is you would go ahead and you would um, allow it to where they have this walkthrough, which is basically a snapshot or a picture of different stages they'll 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 go on, and then it it asks you it asks them questions or it asks them to do specific tasks. What you can do is when you're first starting, get your students to do the walkthrough. So if you're playing a game and you want to introduce them to one of the games. Um, and I've provided in the chat box this game. This game is one of the games that a lot of teachers really enjoy. Um, but if you want them, then have your students make the walkthrough. Um, you can get them into pairs, or you can get them into groups. And it's a great f way for them to also pay attention to these different tasks. So you don't have to do this alone. You might think, wow, that's a lot of work. Um, if you get your students to do this, um, and they can do something like this with a, a snap, a snap guide. I believe it's snapguide.com. Um, or a, they can do this on a Google Doc, and then they can all collaborate. You can give them different sections to work on um, or different games, and that would be great. You can find a lot of different games by subject, actually lots, thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, for different age levels and everything, um, you can find it from Kindersight. Now, I know it says Kindersight, but Joel, um, who's a good friend of mine, has actually made it for much older. Um, as you can see here, there's age 9 through 12, 7 through 12. So it's not just for elementary kids. It's not for kids that are 5 and 6. Will you find games for 3, 4, 5, and 6? Yes. Will you find it for older? Yes. And they're good games. So um, they'll teach all kinds of things. They'll do something like they'll teach the body part. They'll teach about sea monsters, animals. Even here you see cell psycho. Um, so, and then language as well. There's different types of language focus as well. So you can find different games. Shepherdsoftware.com is another uh, favorite for different types of teachers. So you can find that. And I will put that. Um, and this one also has where you can play different types of math games, language games. You see it covers a variety of subjects. There are a lot of sites where you can find great educational games. And it's so wonderful that we have these particular uh, types of sites that help us. We can also get students to create their own games. There's a couple of places for that. A lot of teachers love GetKahoot.com. Their students, um, GetKahoot is any device. They take a trivia quiz that looks like this. The difference is that after you think, and it's very easy. You can find lots of teachers already made them for different subjects. So you can take from theirs and adapt it. You can make your own pretty easily. They have lots of images, and they have it to where it's very quick. But the great thing about GetKahoot.com is it also encourages your students, right after they take this quiz and they all race, and they all see how um, they're in competition with each other, it gives a leaderboard. A leaderboard is part of gaming. It's gamification. And it shows on the point system who's ahead. But what they do, oh, sorry, um, what they do with Gahoot, Get Kahoot is they go and they actually are prompted then, the student, after they take this on any device, whether it be, um, whether it be something like, for example, if they're, it, if they're on their mobile device, they can do it on any type of mobile device, but they can also do it in the computer. So if they do it this way, then it prompts them to create their own game. And so that's the exciting part about it. They can drag and drop. Um, it's timed, and it has a leaderboard. Scratch.mit.edu is another one um, that's very, very good for students to be able to have their own games as well. I think it's a little bit more complicated, but 
Um, I know it used to be offline, but I don't think it is anymore. The great thing about Scratch is it has a rubric. So um, these types of sites are made for educators. They're made for teachers. So they have a bunch of assessment materials. They have lesson plans and so much more for free to offer you to get you started. One of my favorites and that a lot of the students love um, and the teachers, I train teachers regularly. I teach them on online courses. And they really like TinyTap. So there are apps um, that you can create games with. TinyTap is one of the easiest ones. You can, even if you don't use TinyTap, it's only on your iOS device. So you have to have an iPad or you have to have an iOS device. But if you don't have that, don't worry. Because what you can do is you can go to tinytap.it and you can find thousands of free game quizzes that other people have created. And with their own pictures, um, you can record your own voice. You will see the examples, so you can, you can use that for learning. Now, 3dgamelab.com is the easiest way to gamify your class. Like I said, um, it has 75 students. It takes care of everything for you, um, to setting up the lessons and what the point system will be, what the badges you can give. It just does everything for you. It's very fast and it's very quick. Try it with one class if you can. Um, it only has up to 75 students, but some of us, 75 students works out fine, so that's OK. <laughs> Um, Educator Al is one of the ones who uses this, and he talks about his journey into gamification. We had him for the reformsymposium.com, and please go visit his blog if you want to know more because he shares so much more material. He gives you examples exactly if he's done for his eighth grade life science. This is what the grading looks like. This is what it basically is. It's a spreadsheet. And what happens is students, when you, he did his 3D game lab, this is all from 3D game lab. But what he did was he had to set parameters. It's as easy as filling out a kind of like a spreadsheet like this. So what he did was he just basically the estimated time he wanted to have. He put um, if it required approval. Um, he just named things. Um, a lot of these you can copy and paste from your curriculum. Um, he put the type. Is it going to be for one student? Is it a group? Or is it a class project? Um, he put different details as well. You can see he has different things. He had a biome project, research, a commercial, a blog. So it allows for different types of, 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 of assignments. You don't have to have one type of assignment. He also has quizzes and lab posts. So you can have writing in that. He has writing. He has tests. He has uh, drilling. So there's different types of activities that support all of that. He also got to put his badges in. And a lot of times, 3D Game Lab will give you badges that teachers have already made. Now, why badges? Because a lot of teachers, they give badges for not only passing something, for not getting an A or a B. They reward other things. For example, if they readiness achieved starting bloggers. So if they started their blog, they get a badge. If they read 10 pages or 5 chapters in a book, they get a badge for that. If they don't do it, they don't get a badge. It's not that demotivating. It's not like they get an F for it. They just don't get the badge. So the students, usually, they want lots of badges. It takes the concept from really great things like Boy Scouts. When we bowl, we get patches for bowling. When we play sports, we get patches on our Leatherman jacket. When we're in the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts or the Egos, um, the Eagle Scouts, all of that incorporate patches. So we know that patches, and that's what badges are. They're online patches. We can reward things such as um, we can give, or it's not even rewarding, it's recognizing. It's saying, you know what, just getting an A in my class is not as important, is not the only thing that's important. You know what else is important? I recognize that you helped another student. You get a badge for that, for being a great helper. Because all of that, 
is what we need to celebrate in our kids. If one is very creative, then we can encourage that and not make the focus just them passing things. And the more motivated they are, then they're going to do better in their grades. For me, I have found that these kind of systems make it to where even the lowest achievers in my class, the ones that other teachers said, oh, they fell all the time, would make significant progress. Uh, for four years, I had a language learning program where my students, they were beginner speaking English from 12 different countries. And they started with me as beginners. They could say things like, hello, my name is. All of them went to universities. All of them went to US universities. And all of them passed their SAT and ACT courses. Um, so I feel very um, strong about motivation. And um, in my school system, my school district, when I, I um, they told me that with my students, uh, when I ran the language program, that this was the best, highest achieving. That wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to have them all pass. That wasn't my. Uh, my goal was that I really cared about them, and I wanted each of them to feel supported. I didn't want to make them feel um, depressed about themselves. And I would see many students who would come up, and I would say, OK, you're going to get your first 100 points or your first badge for emailing me and giving me your information, because I wanted their emails. <laughs> and I had students that would say, really, I'm going to get automatically starting with points? Really? Are you joking me, teacher? And, they, and I couldn't believe that they didn't even think they had a shot. Um, but they had so many times where they weren't given a chance and a shot. So I think from my experience, it's shown that our kids, when they can be motivated, um, that's really just a fantastic um, way to get them to achieve, to really work hard. Um, so here, he has, you know, a science student. He has. Um, wanderer, and he gives XP. XP is a lot like sort of powers in a blog. So I haven't got into this level. You can read Educator Al. He's been doing this for many years. He's got into those levels. Language learning particularly. There's a lot of online sites, and millions of people use language sites now to learn a language. Two great examples is EnglishCentral.com and Busu.com. They literally have millions. And they have found, because they don't really have teachers or anything like that, they have found that the way to motivate them is through gamification. They give points. They give badges. They have a leaderboard. So they do a lot of things that incorporate gamification. There are things that we have to know when we go into it. And I'm just learning some of this as well. Um, so I'm always a learner. I'm not the best person in gamification, but I'm always reading about it because I'm so interested in it. And I think that it's important that we know that all of us can do this. All of us can add little tiny parts. So the Cool Cat teacher, she, Vicki Davis, she is very helpful. She ran a whole entire massive open online course um, to do this. And so she uh, wrote how gamifying Education, she says there are a couple things you need to know. You have to know about badges, game mechanics, and then she also talks about player types. I thought it was very interesting, so I'll share it with you. If you go to gamification.org, you can find so much helpful information, and that's what she refers to. And then you can find a lot about game mechanics. You can learn more about the things I talked about about um, different types. So you can learn the pedagogy behind it. You can learn the theory. You can learn the research. The other thing is the Bardo diagram. The Bardo diagram, and you don't have to take this verbatim, but it's interesting to know. 
Um, and it's not something that I've incorporated, but I think it's very interesting. Basically, it says that our students can be four different types of a gamer. They can be a socializer, an explorer, a killer, or a cheaper. And I think all of us, when we see this, we can kind of get that. We can see where there's some of our students who are going to get on, and they're just going to want to beat everybody. That's their motivation. And then there's other students who are going to want to help others. You know, they're going to want to get them through, and they're going to help them and be leaders. Um, there's others who are going to explore and be interested in the game area and things like that. So I think that is important to know. I think we'll end already now because it's getting that 30-minute point. And end again with Jane McGonigal. I definitely recommend her book. Reality is Broken. I have a copy of it. It's very inspiring. She was able to heal herself to go through this tough disease through gamification. She was able to motivate herself to get up and do physical exercise and all of this. And she has created many games to change the world. They take students, they take people, and they get them to solve things like famine, um, what's going to happen with the monetary system. I mean, it gets them to do meaningful things. And she says games are an extraordinary way to tap into your most heroic qualities. I think all of us can find that. We all have a game that when we play it, we just feel like we're on top of the world. We just had those moments when we feel like we were a hero. So you can find a lot of the information um, if you go to the Pearl Tree, and I have that somewhere. Uh, let's see, I think it might be here. Um, but the other is if you go to that Listly address that I talked about um, as well. Um, she is, Peggy, she's absolutely, and she was an ISTE, and I think that even might be online. I'm not sure if that is online, but sometimes um, those that is online. So. You might be able, oh, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> um, you can find it on the Listly as well. Um, I've done a Listly on this. Um, I've just started getting into Listly. So sometimes um, I have both Pearl Trees and Listly. It's up to you. They have different links you can explore. And that's it. So thank you so much for joining me and Roscoe another Friday. Don't forget to get your certificate. and. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. And next week, I will see you at the same time. It's free. Bring a friend or let somebody else know. <laughs>